I'm so glad I found everything that I needed in Jesus. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you go with me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John in chapter 8 this morning. John chapter 8, I want you to look with me in verse 31. John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus is speaking. And by the way, as I was introducing folks uh, out of my periphery here, I had missed one very special lady that's just back from hip surgery, Miss Carol Overly. It's good to see you this morning. She was here with us last week, and good to see her back. Brother Wayne and Miss Carol have been dealing with a number of different things. It's good to have them with us today. Well, if you, if you found John chapter 8 this morning, why don't you, in verse 30, why don't you stand and join me in standing out of respect and reverence for God's Word. In John chapter 8, in verse 31, I want you to notice Jesus is speaking here, and he's speaking to a very specific group. He says, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. There were some uh, different folks that were questioning him and different folks that were doubting him, but there were a group of folks that were uh, believing on him, and, and, and those who believed on him were listening, but those who were doubting him were also spe- uh, listening. And he says, and Jesus, uh, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. I want to point out a truth this morning. Do you know there's a difference between a convert and a disciple? There is. A convert, a believer, is someone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on a cross, was buried, and rose again. He went back to heaven, and if I confess my sins to him, I believe on him that he is the Son of God, he can save my soul, then I become a believer. I become a Christian. But my friend, there is a difference between a believer or a convert and disciple. John Wesley said, the world will not change by making converts but by making disciples. Notice again now in verse 31, he says, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Verse 32 is our text this morning. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed. Now these aren't the believers. These are some of the folks that were disagreeing with him and doubting him. We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, thou shalt be made free? Now, now pause, pause. And what they're willingly ignorant of is the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity. And by the way, they were under Roman captivity at this very moment. Look at verse 44, 34. And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Notice verse 36. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great day. We thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for this. Lord, not only the weekend, Lord, to celebrate America's independence, but Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come and celebrate a, great, a much greater liberty and freedom, the freedom of the tyranny of sin and Satan. And Jesus, we thank you for setting us free and making us free. Lord, we pray today as we gather in your name and we sing your praises, God, you would be pleased and honored in all that we do. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that all that we want and all that we need and all that we seek can be found in you. And thank you for making yourself so readily available. Jesus, we love you this morning. And in your name we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. Brother Roger said over 240, I believe it's 246 years ago, uh, on July 4th, tomorrow, tomorrow on July 4th, 1776, a group of men met in Philadelphia, the Second Continental Congress. And they'd been working on and, and they'd been uh, dealing with the, uh, the issues of the tyranny of Great Britain and King George III, and it was on July 4th, 1776, that the Second Continental Congress signed into to law, the law of the land, the Declaration of Independence, that they were severing their ties and loyalty to the uh, sovereign crown of England and to King George III, and, and uh, that went into effect on July 4th. Now, it's interesting, I want to make a point here, that that independence was not recognized 
by King George in the sovereign crown of Great Britain until a, a much later date, a date that we probably don't even know about or even think about, September the 3rd, 1783. There's a difference between 1776 and 1783 when Britain finally recognized the United States of America as a free and independent country. Now, it's interesting, um, you may have noticed that this year as well, so we have that, we're celebrating, we're commemorating this weekend, and, and just a few weeks ago, uh, last year, our country signed into law a, a new holiday, June 19th, and that commemorates the, the enforcement of uh, the Abraham Lincoln's um, Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, President Lincoln, on January the 1st, 1863, Signed into law, the United States of America, they, everyone, they, all enslaved people were emancipated. They were set free. But it wasn't until <clears throat> June, I'm sorry, September. It wasn't until, uh, oh, that was January 1st, 1863. It wasn't until June 19, 1865, some two years later, when the Emancipation Proclamation was officially uh, delivered and enforced in the farthest regions of the United States of America. As the uh, General, uh, uh, General Gordon Granger and his Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas, listen, they put into play what had already been enacted. You see, Pastor, thanks for the history lesson, but what, has this, what does this have to do with me today here in, uh, in Holland, Michigan in, in 2022? Well, it has a great deal to do with you and I. Number one, we enjoy the freedom of our country. Number two, all of us enjoy the freedom uh, uh, from, from slavery. But listen, there's a much greater freedom that we enjoy today. I want you to go back with me in our text this morning. And I want you to notice Jesus' answer. It was not an honest question. In fact, it wasn't even a genuine question. They were saying, listen, we're, we're, we've not been servants to anybody. And they willingly, that they had been servants to many different nations over the years. In fact, they were a Roman vassal state at that point. But Jesus wasn't so much concerned about the political climate or uh, who was the uh, president of the leader of the land. He was talking about to us individually. Because individually, listen, individually we're born, and individually we'll live, and individually we'll die. And Jesus wants you and he wants me to experience something even far greater than political freedom. I've got good friends, a, a man by the name of Pastor Moon Thang. He's a pastor over in Myanmar right now. And they've come in, they've rifled his church, they've run him out of town, they've burned his building, they've persecuted him several times. But listen, though he lives under political bondage, he enjoys spiritual freedom. He said, what is that spiritual freedom? Notice with me, <clears throat> he says this here. In verse 34, Jesus answered them, verily, verily. Now, when, you say, when, you, when Jesus says that, he says, listen, that means sit up, pay attention. He says, I'm about to tell you a really serious truth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You see, there's a far greater bondage, there's a far greater can I say, a far greater problem than we have any political uh, problem, and that's a sin problem. Each and every man and woman ever born on the face of this planet deals with a sin problem. Because Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they passed to their children a sin nature. You say, well, Pastor, what's, what's the great deal about a sin nature? What's, what's the problem? Well, hold something here in John chapter 8, and and just turn over with me to just to one place, to Romans in chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and look at verse 23, the last verse of Romans chapter 6. A very familiar verse in the Bible. What's the problem? Why is this such a problem that Jesus wants to deal with it? Notice here, for the wages of sin is death. My friend, one day... You are going to die. I'm going to die. You know why that is? Because I'm a sinner. And the, 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 the condition of sin is this, that I have a, an immortal spirit and a spirit and soul that lives inside of me, and so do you. But we live in a, a body. We live in a shell. We live in a house that's weak and frail, and it gets tired. And one day, it's going to die. 
And that spirit and that soul, you, the real you, the eternal you, the permanent you, it's going to go somewhere. It's either going to go to heaven above or it's going to go to hell beneath. See, that's the problem with sin. And Jesus came to deal not with a political problem, but with a sin problem. Because, uh, my friend, no matter what country you live in, no matter what gender you are, no matter what age you live in, every, there's one thing that every single living, breathing per, a person has who's ever been born way there, even from uh, the, the children of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, all the way down to the last man or the last woman that will ever be born. By the way, there's only two genders. It, one man, a man and a woman. I don't care how many choices they give you. Can I just say, what? here's the thing. God made it very clear. God created male and God created female. You say, where does the confusion come in? What God makes clear, the devil makes difficult. That's where it comes in. What God declares clarity in, the devil brings confusion in. Don't be mad at those dear people. They've been deceived. They've been lied to. They've been sold a bill of goods by our society and our media. What they need is truth from Jesus Christ. My friend, Jesus wants to offer us a great freedom. Turn back in your Bibles with me to the book of John. You see, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. The problem is every single man or woman has a problem called a sin problem. And that problem is going to bring about death. That means your body's going to die. Your spirit's going to depart into eternity. And my friend, either it's going to go to heaven or hell, and Jesus wants to offer you, listen, a deliverance from that problem. Notice with me again in verse 32, it says it in verse 36. Notice our text, which is verse 36. It says, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. How can I have freedom from this problem of sin? Well, one of the first things that I want to uh, point out to you is wording. Every word matters. Brother Brian is so often will point out to us that wording matters. This is, I believe, one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Notice with me. Uh, look at verse 32. Jesus says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall, what's that next word? Make. You free, go down, look at me in verse 36. If the Son therefore shall, shall what? He shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You see, many times this verse is quoted as set you free. My friend, there's a wholesale difference between setting something free and making something free. There are people down in, in the city of Holland, and I'm sure somewhere in the city of Holland there's a, uh, there's a jail, a city jail. I'm sure in Ottawa County there's a county jail. And listen, today, if you decided to get plucky enough and you had someone that you were particularly interested in, in one of those uh, uh, correctional facilities, you could go set them free. We used to watch it on, on uh, the old westerns. Uh, they would back up the dynamite and back it up to the county jail. And everybody would plug their ears and blow a little hole in the wall with 17 sticks of dynamite. All right, And uh, one of the uh, great fa fallacies of Hollywood. Now listen, they set them free. And they would run out and jump on their horses and run off. But listen, what happens when someone is set free, but they're not legally made free, what happens is the deputies and the sheriff and the warden go after them. And then they get everybody and bring them back to a better jail and a bigger jail. Now listen, you could go downtown today and you could, if you were clever enough, you could set somebody free. But listen, you can't make someone free. Only a judge, only a person in authority can make someone free. See, this isn't, isn't setting someone free. This is a legal term. This is a justifying term. The Bible says in verse 30, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This is Jesus saying, listen, we're not just going to come along and have somebody just slide off and, and set you free. No, Jesus says, I can legally, officially, eternally, morally make you free. Now, my friend, when the judge makes someone free, that same warden, that same sheriff, those same police that would go after the person who's in jail, they come up and they unlock the jail. And they open the door and they escort that man out and they give him all of his possessions and they open the door and shake his hand and tell him to have it. And he walks out a free man. And he has his freedom. 
Listen, when Jesus comes into your heart, when Jesus saves your soul, listen, you're not a fugitive from judgment. Listen, you're a free person. You're a free man and a free woman. Listen, you've been pardoned. You've been washed. You've been cleansed. You've been justified. Listen, you're free. Now, Jesus, when Jesus makes us free, he gives us three wonderful freedoms. And we're going to look at that just very briefly this morning. First of all, Jesus makes us free, first of all, from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? Again, if you'll go back with me, and you say, well, I was just there in Romans 6, 23. So if you don't want to turn there again, you don't have to. But I want you to notice the second half of the verse. In Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The penalty of sin is to die and be separated from God forever. If you're taking notes this morning, jot this down in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. It says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was, uh, was cast into the lake of fire. That's what's known as the second death. My friend, when you physically die, your body is separated from your spirit and soul. But there's coming a far greater death, my friend, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not saved, if you're not forgiven, my friend, then that guilty spirit and soul is going to be called up out of hell. It's going to stand at a place called the great white throne judgment. And they're going to open all of the books and God is going to reveal every word you ever said and every deed you ever did and every thought you ever thought. Listen, my friend, and you're going to be found guilty. And your spirit and soul is going to be cast forever into a horrible place called the lake of fire. And the Bible says that is the second death. It is to be permanently forever separated from a holy God who loves you and sent his son to be the payment of your sin. See, my friend, that's the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is to die physically, but then ultimately to die spiritually and to be separated from God. But when Jesus makes you free, he makes us free, first of all, from the penalty of sin. Listen, my friend, though this body may die one day, if Jesus doesn't come back, listen, though this body may die, I may experience a physical death, but because I've been made free from the penalty of sin, I will never experience the spiritual death or the second death. My friend, I hope today that you've experienced that wonderful, liberating experience of being made free from the penalty of sin. If you've never been made free from the penalty of sin, at the, at just a few minutes at the end of the service, we're going to have what's called an invitation. It's an opportunity for you, right where you are in your pew, to respond to what the Lord is laying on your heart. It's an opportunity for you to respond to the truth that God has presented you this morning to this Bible message and for you to do business with God, and I hope you will. But number one, Jesus wants to make us free from the penalty of sin. That's to die and be separated from God. But not only that, number two, I want you to go with me. You're in the book of Romans. If you're in Romans chapter 6, I want you to back up to verse 1, and I want you to notice the second freedom where Jesus wants to make you and I free From this curse of sin. Notice with me in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know the people thought it. You know people are saying that today. Well I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. What does it matter? Oh it matters a lot. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Notice this. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Number two, Jesus not only wants to make you and I free from the penalty of sin, he wants to free us from the power of sin. What's the power of sin? Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion or rule over you, for you are not under the law, 
but under grace. Notice with me in verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become the servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The power of sin. See, what happens is this. When you go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I don't want to die and go to hell. Jesus, I want to go to heaven. Jesus, I I want to be delivered from this penalty of sin. Jesus, would you save me? And he saves you. He he sends his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to live inside of you. And now, listen, I want you to take this picture. Picture this old dilapidated building. It's run down. It's, It's boarded up. It's empty. There's no life there. And all of a sudden, somebody, maybe you've got a house like that on your street. Or maybe you're driving to work and you see this old dilapidated business. And all of a sudden, you see it's all cleaned up. And the the boards are all gone and the windows are refreshed and somebody painted it and put a new roof on it and they got lights in it now. And and they've remodeled it and on the sign they put, under new management. Do you know that's what you look like spiritually when you get saved? The Lord, listen, there's new management that lives comes inside. And listen, he does a wonderful transforming work from the inside to the outside. See, religion tries to clean you up from the outside to the inside. That's not how God works. God works from the inside to the outside. He transforms you. He transforms me. But listen, when Jesus makes you free, he puts, you, he puts new man, you're under new management. When before you got saved, Jesus says, he tells us that we were the, listen, we were the children of the devil. I had a sin nature and I had no ability, listen, to overcome that. I can clean myself up. Listen, I have a little dog. My dog, I could give my dog a bath every single day of the week. I I could put a dress on her. I could put shoes on her. You know what she still is? She's a dog. All right. Now listen, you know, if she was ever going to be, listen, if she was ever going to be anything else, she'd have to get born again. She'd have to get born as a different creature. Listen to me. When the Holy Spirit moved in, he put you, he made you a new creature. He gave with inside of you an abiding presence of God Almighty. Listen, that enables us now to say no to our old boss. Our old boss was the devil. Our old boss was our feelings and our desires and our emotions. And we were, the Bible says, a slave to that. We were in bondage to that. And we had no power to resist that. But now we're under new management. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he says, listen, now you have a choice. You know what's the great thing about freedom? You have choices. Choices are powerful. You make your choices And your choices make you. You see, now there's the old boss, sin and Satan. And you have the new boss, the Savior. And the deciding vote, so you have one person voting for bad, one person voting for good. Guess who's the tiebreaker? You are. You are. Notice with me, I want you to notice this verse in Romans chapter 6. In verse 20, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now listen, but now, being made free from sin and become the servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Notice with me, I want you to notice in verse 12, a second verse. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof you see you have satan and sin on this side saying hey hey why don't you look on that hey why don't you click on that hey why don't you take that why don't you drink that why don't you go there and then you have the savior on the other side say don't do that you know you don't want to do that you know that's bad you know that's wrong. You know you're going to feel di- gu- guilty. You know you're going to feel uh, dirty. You know you're, you, it's going it's to hurt you. You are the deciding vote. Jesus has made us free from the power of sin. You know what? That means I don't have to obey sin and Satan. I can obey God. He gives us the grace to obey him. But listen, the choice is yours. Number one, Jesus makes us free from the penalty of sin. Number two, Jesus makes us free from the power of sin. I now have the choice. I can choose to deny the devil and deny sin, and I can choose to live for God. Oh, but my friend, there's a third one, and it's a good one. I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation, the last book 
of the Bible. The last book of the Bible. In the last two chapters, Revelation chapter 21, I want you to notice with me in verse, starting in verse 1. Jesus died on the cross. He offers us salvation. He says, if you'll trust me, if you'll believe in me, you can be made free from the, power, from the penalty of sin. You don't have to die and go to hell. Number two, you can be indwelt by the Spirit of God and have, uh, you can be made free from the power of sin. Listen, you can choose to live for God. But my friend, there's a glorious future awaiting the children of God. Notice with me in chapter uh, 21 and verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Notice with me in verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Notice, for the former things are passed away. My friend, the third glorious liberty that God has promised to His children is this. Freedom from the very presence of sin. The presence of sin. My friend, immediately you're delivered from the penalty of sin. You'll never face the second death and go to hell. You are progressively, listen, as, you have, as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God and grow in grace, we're free. We have the liberty. We choose to deny sin and, slur, and serve the Savior. That's the power of sin. But listen, one day, there's going to be a day where God's children will be delivered from the very presence of sin. That means sin will be done away with. It'll be gone. It'll be banished. It's going to burn up. Listen, think about this. No, you'll never think another bad thought. You'll never be tempted to do wrong. You'll never desire anything that is separate or apart from the will of God. You'll never have a thought or a will or a desire that is anything less than 100% completely holy. You'll never be tempted. You'll never be torn. You'll, listen, we will never again disappoint the Savior. You ever think about that? Though it's coming a day where we will never again say or think, or do, or even desire to disappoint the Savior. The very power and presence of sin will be eradicated. What a glorious, wonderful future awaits the child of God. Are you a child of God? Those promises are not made to those who are not Christians. Those promises are not made to those who are not followers, believers, saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope today, listen, you live in America, someone paid the price for your freedom. Thank God for our soldiers. Soldiers, men and women, thank you for the families, the soldiers who bought our freedom. Thank you for the patriots who stood. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. But Jesus won a far greater battle. I do want you to I just, just, just point out a truth here. It's interesting. From the Declaration of Independence, there were several years to the realization of it. From the Emancipation Proclamation to the realization of liberty, freedom for everyone in America, there was a, a period of years. Listen, right now, it doesn't look like you're free. Right now, we live in a world cursed by sin. We live in bodies that are in bondage to sin. Listen, it doesn't look like these things are true but they are. We see them through the eyes of faith, through the promises of God. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you. Thank you for your wonderful plan of salvation. Thank you, Lord, that no matter who we are, no matter what we are, no matter what we've done, where we've been, God, whether we're living now or, Lord, whether we lived, Lord, 2,000 years ago, halfway around the world in a, a t completely different country and culture, Lord, the need is still the same. It's a need to be forgiven from our sins. And Lord, I pray today, if there's one here today, Lord, that they know by the witness of their own heart 
that if Jesus were to come back this very moment and the trumpet would sound and he would take from us in this, this, this wretched earth, he would take the saved that they would be left behind. Or Lord, if some tragedy would befall them today, and God, that this would be the last day of their life on earth, Lord, they, they have no confidence that they would go to heaven. And even beyond that, they're pretty sure that they would die and go to a sinner's hell. Lord, I pray that they would know today that you love them. And God, that they, you've made a way for them, Lord, to be made free from this penalty of sin called death. And the fear of eternal separation from you. Father, I pray that today, Lord, that if there's one here today, Lord, that right now, right where they're sitting, they would open their hearts to you. And God, they would confess their sin to you. And Lord, they would cry out to you. And Lord, they would just call upon your name and ask you to save them and forgive them. And Lord, I pray that they would do that today. And Lord, they would put their faith and their trust in you and you alone. Say, Lord, you have paid the price of their pardon. I pray today, Lord, for all of us who've made that decision and become Christians, Lord, I pray that there would be those, Lord, that we would, first of all, thank you for the glorious freedom you've given us. And Lord, be thankful for the wonderful future that you promise us. Lord, I pray and ask, oh God, that we would live out the reality of being free people. We would deny sin and Satan in our lives and in our flesh and in our minds. And God, we choose to serve you. And Father, I pray, Lord, that we would have that abiding hope of the wonderful coming day. We'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. Lord, thank you this morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. We'll stand this morning in a time of prayer as the instrumentalists begin to play a verse of invitation. Maybe you need to receive.